I want to talk church this morning. We already have been, but I want to talk even further with that. And this is a series that I've called, Let's Talk Church. And, and sometimes I think we just need to stop and talk about things, especially things that matter, like the church, and, and, and in some ways ask, why are we doing what we do? Have you ever done that? Why am I doing that? Anyway, and that's a great place to start. I, I believe uh, that we need to start with the why. Somebody wrote a book about that, Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And then when you understand why you're doing something, the uh, how and the what and all of that just falls in place. But why is a great question. We need to talk about what we're on about a as a church. Have you, ever, uh, have you ever lost something of value? I get, isn't it just a terrible feeling when you lose your car keys? <laughs> which I do frequently, uh, your wallet or your purse, ladies, or something of value, when you lose something of value, it's just one of the most anxious moments until you find it. Uh, I know when it comes to my mobile phone, uh, that's got to be like, that's one of the worst things to leave someplace, isn't it? And, and to lose your phone, it's like my whole life, oh, what am I going to do? It's a terrible, terrible feeling to lose something of value. And there is something in society, and yea, verily, in the church, that's been lost. And it's something that's so important that it gets overlooked a lot. It really, uh, people often don't understand the importance of, of this valuable thing that's lost. And we don't often think about it and think about the impact that it is. And that's something that I'm talking about is godly values. Godly values. Now, something that's valuable means this. It means it's important. It's of worth. That's what makes it valuable. Like if you, if you didn't value your phone or your wallet, your purse, your car keys, you wouldn't go looking for it very determined. You'd be, oh, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean anything. And, and we would just pass it off. We wouldn't get upset if it wasn't of value to us. And godly values in society, well, we'd expect that they'd go lost there. It, but in the church, that's where we really need, and we're going to focus this morning on the values that really shape culture here at City Church and other churches have their own, well, how important are they and why is it important that we find those? I want to go over to Mark chapter 6. This passage of Scripture speaks volumes, and I want it to speak volumes into our hearts this morning. In uh, Mark chapter 6, Jesus goes to church. Don't you love it? You know, Jesus actually goes to church. And he's, he's here right now. The Spirit of God is here. Mark chapter 6, and we're going to read 1 to 6. And it says this, it says, Jesus left there, he, the there is chapter 5, and he went to his hometown. Uh, have you ever gone back to your hometown, you know, where you were born or raised after being away for a long time? I don't know about you, but I have. Like, I was born and raised on an island south of Detroit. Gros, Gros Seal means big island in, in French. And it's really, like, an anxious time to go back there because I hardly ever go back there. Like, I don't know how many years it's been since I was there. And I haven't been to a high school reunion. Anybody go to their high school reunions? Hardly anybody. It's like, why do I want to see those people? I was bullied there. They, you know, they were way better than me. I was the, the nerdy one, the ugly duckling or whatever. Uh, it's, a, it's an anxious time to go back to a place of familiarity, a place where they know me. They saw me grow up. They watched me make mistakes. I got labeled there. Perhaps I got mistreated there. And Jesus goes to his hometown, and his disciples are with him. Now, we don't know that his disciples have ever been to Jesus' hometown, or it's certainly probably not with Jesus. And I don't know what he's telling them. They're walking there, and 
It's like, hey guys, wait until you see <laughs> the, you know, wait until you meet the family. Wait until till you see where I went to school. Wait, wait until you see the 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 soccer field that I played soccer on, <laughs> or whatever. You know, he didn't. But uh, verse two, and when the Sabbath came, that's their their. On Saturday, it's our Sunday. It's the place, it's the time, the one time where you go to church and worship God. It was their Sabbath or Shabbat. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, their church, in other words, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things? They asked. What's his wisdom? What's his wisdom and, and that which has been given to him? And what are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Now, they'd heard about these miracles, and now they're witnessing the profound wisdom of the Word himself unpacking what he had authored or wrote. Nobody can tell a story like the one that wrote the story. Nobody can expound on a book better than the one that wrote the book. Nobody does a better job than the author. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the beginning, the end, the alpha, the omega. He gets up and he starts to unpack the scriptures that he inspired. And they're amazed. And they've heard about these miracles and he shows them a little bit uh, of, of a lot. And even that little bit is enough to where, whoa, who is this? Listen to this. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? And the brothers of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon rattles off his four brothers. Aren't his sisters here with us? It doesn't name them, but... However, many, Mary had quite a large family. And they took offense at him. You go back to where you were born and raised, and you're changed. Everybody else would have changed if I, go, if I ever did go to my high school reunion. I would be thinking, wait till they see how much I've changed. I'm not the same guy that I was. I'm not that kid that you picked on. I'm not that dumb idiot, you know, that you called names and everything. Uh, and you're going into that. But, but without realizing, everybody else has moved on too. Everybody else has changed. Perhaps that bully is a really nice guy now. <laughs> And that person that picked on you, maybe they've got mercy now. Maybe they got saved. And they're blown away by, by the fact that he can teach like nobody else, that he's doing miracles, but they're offended. And they say, who, who do you think that you are? They took offense at him. And Jesus says to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his own town, among his relatives, in his own home. There's no honor there. Something is, is missing out, out of that church. Remember, again, the context where he is. He's in a meeting, a, a worship place, a place of worship, a synagogue. Today we translate a church. Verse 5. He could not do any miracles there. That's an incredible statement. I hear it a lot. And I've heard it a lot over about 40 years of being a, a Christian. Where are the miracles? Why aren't we seeing this and that and the things they did in the book of Acts and the things that Jesus did? And he said, these things you'll do and greater things than these because I go to the Father. And the answer is right here. It's not blame God. God's playing hard to get. He's holding out. No, it's nothing to do with God's willingness. It's all to do with us and what we've lost that we need to reclaim. If we are to see those miracles happen, if we are to see the outbreak 
uh, of revival, which so many people are, are longing for. And we want revival. We sing about revival. We need to ha have that brought back to life. But, but what exactly is it going to take? And, and, and it says he couldn't do any miracles there. Not would not, but he could not. The God that can do anything couldn't do it. Except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. We would settle for that. Quite frankly, in, in the church today, uh, around certainly in our society, postmodern world, we would settle for just a few miracles. But this alludes to the fact that there's a lot more. I, I get so excited about that and and at the same time, I get frustrated, to be quite honest. I'd spend probably more time than the average person thinking about this because I'm a pastor and I've given my heart into the work of, of the church because I believe in the church. It's, the church is the bride of Christ. Somebody prayed this morning, she's without spot or wrinkle, and yet so many of us that go to church are pointing out the faults of the bride. She's the bride of Christ. She's the, the body of Jesus. How dare we say anything except magnificent? How dare we do anything except overlook the faults and forgive? And we talked about that a bit last week, but he, he couldn't do anything there. How frustrating would it be to have the power to perform miracles and yet not be able to do it. I, I think of God, I think, oh God, that must just break your heart to have your hands tied. What is it that's tying your hands? And maybe we need to unloose the hands of God and not tie the hands of the Almighty who can do anything and wants to do anything but couldn't do anything in this church that he goes to. And then it says, verse 6, he was amazed at their lack of faith. Now we put that down, and I've heard this preached, I've preached it myself, that the reason that he couldn't work miracles in that place was because of their lack of faith. He did marvel at their lack of faith. But this morning, I want to present to you that maybe there's something more to it than we just didn't have the faith. I've seen people try to work faith up and even take Romans 10, 17, uh, you know, that faith cometh by uh, hearing and hearing by the word of God and, and we'll just pump more word into our, our, our ears through podcast and vidcast and, you know, we'll just keep the word flowing and we're going to get this robust faith so, so that if we could get that faith stronger, we can see more miracles. Now, there is a, a part to that that's true, but it's not the whole picture. And what we're going to un unpack in this series about talking church I believe is going to reveal something that's missing, not just faith, which means a deep-seated trust in God, because individually, we can have great faith. You might be trusting God right now with something that you just think, I've Maybe it's that child you're raising. Maybe it's that job that you don't have. Maybe, maybe it's, a, it's a sickness that you're trying to be healed from, and you've got this deep-seated trust in God. And, and I encourage you, keep it strong. Keep developing it. As individuals, we definitely need to be Christ followers to the nth degree, and, and, and keep that trust burning hot. Keep it strong. Keep it firm. But that's not the only reason that the Almighty couldn't perform mighty miracles in the church of his day that he went into. We put it down to a, a lack of faith, but could it also be a lack of values? Could it also be that what's lost that I said at the beginning which is values, that which we see valuable. Maybe that which we see valuable isn't what God wants us to see as valuable. We put it down to that. He's in a position here in his hometown amongst his friends, his family, his relatives, 
He's in a place of incredible familiarity. They're so familiar with him. And if we're not careful, church can become that place. It did where he was, where he attended to worship. Their familiarity got in the way to the point where they had no value for him. They didn't see him as the Jesus that we read about that's, man, what would I do if he walked into this room? <laughs> I would get on my knees and I, I would worship. That, that movie, I could only imagine, you know, that song came out of there. What am, what am I going to do when I go to heaven and I break out and I, and I just see him face to face and I'm, I'm there in the kingdom of heaven. What's it going to be like? What's, what's going to be my response? And, and we could only imagine, we could only guess. But every Sunday, <laughs> we come into a, a house of God, a house of worship. And we could either come in with the same attitude that they came in. Oh, well. That's just our worship team sang that song before. <laughs> yep, Pastor Ed, yeah, I know him. Know the message. <laughs> Another worship service. Singing about Waymaker. Heard that song before. What's for lunch? I wonder if so-and-so is going to be here because I, I want to ask them a, a how-to question because they do taxes. <laughs> In the place of incredible worth, that's what worship means, worth-ship, gets cheapened, gets dumbed down, gets diluted to the level of our familiarity. And we wonder why we're not seeing an outbreak of miracles and revival. Oh, this series, uh, I, I've looked forward to this series for quite some time because I've put a lot into it. I, I ask why a lot. And I believe the time I spend with God asking that question and seeking Him, well, He gives answers. They're not always the answers that I want to hear. <laughs> They're not always the answers that I want to preach about, I'll be honest with you. It's like, oh, God, why don't I just tell each individual how great they are and we can go home? You can do it. You're amazing. God loves you. Let's go. But I want to see intensely, and I believe that you do too because you're here. I want to see the miracles of Almighty God break out amongst God's people. I want to see the glory of God so thick that it would take everything to stand in His presence. I want to see revival break out starting in the house of God. I want to see our city taken because we are a light on a hill and all the darkness that's out there, the suicide and the, and the depression and all the diseases that are out there. I, I believe, like you, I want to see that alleviated. I want to see God show up. I intensely want to see, see God show up. So I can't put this down to, oh, it's just a lack of individual faith. I don't believe so. I believe it's a lack of value or the worth or the importance placed on something. Church, the church, and someone. God and the people that he loves, which is everybody sitting around you right now and a whole lot more. So I have values. Why? Why do we need clear values? And, and our values, some of them are on the wall as you leave, on the, on the wall in the foyer there. God dropped those into my heart just one after the other, and I just couldn't get my thumbs to type fast enough into my phone to put those in there as he anointed it. Then I shared those with Cassie uh, Skinner, and she just 
put the images up uh, uh, and just did an amazing job. And they capture something here that's not just, oh, that's pretty. They got some little de decor on the wall. That's, that's lovely, uh, but I'm not paying much attention to it. We need to pay attention. Well, I have values, number one, if you're taking notes. Values attract people with similar values. Birds of a feather do flock together. And if you don't believe it, go, a, go to a sporting event where people are diehard and they value their team. Go, go to a sci-fi convention and you'll see a whole bunch of people over in one area that just are diehard. They value Star Wars so intensely and a whole other group of people that value Star Trek so intensely and usually the two don't, uh, don't, don't meet. It's amazing. <laughs> what you value, you attract. There's something incredibly attractive about someone who has godly values. And that's why those values are, are incredibly important for us as a church. And we're going to see the importance of that as we move through this. If you attract a value of integrity... In other words, you're honest. You tell the truth. You're going to repel people that are dishonest, that are liars. They won't come near you. If you value unity, that you will, even to your own detriment, you will keep the unity of the, uh, of the family of God in the peace. If you value unity, people that are divisive, that talk trash all the time, that gossip, they're going, to, they're going to beat a wide path around you. But you're going to attract people of, of the same value, of the same quality. And what that does, and what it would do in the meeting that Jesus was in, in the church that Jesus was in, it, would, it leads to something absolutely incredible. Psalm 133, we won't go there, but uh, with unity, God commands the blessing. How, how good and how precious it is uh, uh, for those that walk together in unity. God commands the blessing there. Values attract people with similar values. Number two, values lead to decisive action. Why have values that are clear and write them out? Because values lead to decisive action. People get treated differently when they're valued versus when they're not valued. Uh, some years ago, I worked at what's now the Marriott Hotel in San Diego. It was the premier five-star hotel. It was called the Intercontinental back then. And uh, some of the rooms there were $2,000 a night. We're talking like 1984, 85. We had the president of the United States back then stay at our hotel. It was quite, uh, quite a nice place. And to get that job was a real honor. I knew somebody in Tulsa where I was doing a similar thing at a hotel there. And uh, I just treated people the way I'd want to be treated if I was spending that kind of money and having somebody carry suitcases, which is basically what I did. I was a bellman. So I got that job there. And I remember uh, going in, I'd usually work the night shift. I'd go in there, and, and there'd be an exchange. Okay, what's, what do we need to know? Who, who are the guests that are staying here? We had uh, John Denver, you know, a famous singer, uh, staying there. So I go in, oh, John Denver's in the house. Okay, great. You know, what does he need? Where is he? He's gone out to eat, but he'll be back in. And, and so I was always keen to know who was staying there. And, and then one, one evening, I went in and it was a real buzz about the place. Everybody was talking about this particular guy that was a guest at the hotel. And he was seen running around the roof. He got up there somehow, had really long hair, <laughs> and nobody knew really who he was, but he was paying $2,000 a night to stay at the hotel. So he had one of the presidential rooms. And the reason people were talking about this guy was he was a big tipper, and that's how we made our money, was uh, cash. 
So if I carried the suitcases for the average person, you know, back then I'd get $5, $10. If somebody was a big tipper, I mean a big tipper, you know, I might get a 20. And we had names for the different uh, bills. $5 note was a fin. Oh, I got a fin. Okay, cool. And I'd walk home with a wad of cash at the end of my shift. And that's how I made my money. I made good money. This particular guy, his minimum tips were $100 bills. You're talking 1985. That's a big tip for care. And people were getting tipped for if he needed a pack of cigarettes. If you went down and got him a pack of cigarettes out of the machine, he'd come back, hand him the pack of cigarettes, and he'd give you a $100 tip. So he was the talk of the hotel. And things got quiet. It was kind of late. And this Harley Davidson pulls up out the front. And uh, there's a big circular drive, and it had a red curb. I mean, don't park there because that's for fire trucks in case there's a hotel fire. The trucks need a place to pull up and, and park. And he pulls up and he parks this guy, this, his, his Harley, and you can guess who he is. Uh, and I walk out. And this guy had ripped jeans before ripped jeans were in vogue. I know now it's like, oh, you got ripped jeans. What'd you pay for them, you know, for somebody else to rip your jeans? Back then, ripped jeans meant, oh, well, he was way ahead of his time. <laughs> Pulls up on the Harley, parks it there. And I wasn't nice to him because I didn't value, I didn't know who it was. I looked at him, summed him up. You don't belong here. You don't hold much value, so I'm going to treat you cordially, kind of polite but not nice. You're going to have to move your bike. So I stuck to the rules, and as I'm telling him to move the Harley, the Front desk manager comes running out, <laughs> and he goes, oh, Mr. Capasolo was his fake name. Uh, still remember it. And he goes, uh, sir, he goes, is there anything that you need? I'm sure that Ed here will accommodate your every need. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> it's him. <laughs> I could tell. And it's like, somebody will move that for you, sir. Don't, don't you even worry about it. And I, I, I remember I, I thought to myself, because I was a Christian, I'd already been to Bible college, and I thought to myself, I've got some prejudice there. I, I didn't see him as a person of value because he didn't look like a person of value that could give me anything out of the exchange. So I treated him less than I would have treated anybody staying in the presidential suite. I wonder how many times that we look out at people, and it could be based on their socioeconomic status, could be based on just whether they're famous, semi-famous, how they dress, whether they're young or old, whatever color they are, their accent, our values are the way we treat people, and that's why values are so important, because I'm not going to go too far out of my way to find what I don't find valuable. I think about one of our values to, to go after lost people, that we'll go anywhere to reach anyone. But do we really mean that? Not just the anywhere, because the anywhere, anywhere can be a nice a walk across the foyer to say hi to somebody. But will we go anywhere to reach anyone? And if we don't see people as valuable, if, we're, if they're just an anyone that doesn't hold any value to us when God sent his only son for them and says they are incredibly valuable. If the shepherd loses one sheep, that's only 1%. He goes and leaves everything to go after them, to find them. If the woman loses one out of 10 coins, that's 10%. She leaves it all to go after. If the, if the father loses one out of the two sons, that's 50%. He, he leaves and goes out to meet that son. How about us? You see, values are incredibly important, but I feel they've been lost because I won't go far out of my way 
unless I see people as valuable. Number three, values are important because values reduce the need for rules. Oh, we all hate rules. The law. It's always the law versus grace. Conversations amongst Christians. It's been going on as long as I've been a Christian. Debates about the law and grace. We're going to hit on that sometime up the road. The values re replace the need for rules. Because all of a sudden now, I walk across the room, not because I have to, because there's some rule here that I have to walk across rooms or I'll go anywhere to reach anyone or I have to serve my way to greatness. It's, it's, it's not a got to anymore. If I see value in, in a person, it's a get to. I get to serve. You can't hold me back. Not a, a berate from the pastor. You know, if, any, if you weren't so lazy, we would, we would have those signs put out there. We'd have cop, lots of people wanting to park cars and open doors for little old ladies and, and mothers with prams and, and everybody else. It, it, and so the reason that a lot of stuff doesn't happen that needs to happen in the house of God to see an outbreak of revival. Revival is not a selfish word. It's not going to happen from a group of people getting together that are selfish and just want to see some miracles to prove there's a God. <laughs> That's kind of telling it like it is in so many meetings I've been at. Revival is going to happen when corporately we start to honor one another and treat one another and serve one another and love one another and walk across rooms to get to another that's not the same as our mother, you know, to go out of our way to love people. Yeah. That's when revival is going to take place. That's when there's going to be an outbreak of the miraculous power of God because God's heart is breaking. And he's saying, come on. I'm not going to give you some cheap trick. I'm not a, mag a magician. I'm the Almighty. And I'm Almighty in love. Not to prove that He's God. He could do that in a split second. He could have a myriad of angels show up in the sky or this room right now and go, now, do you believe? If I value God, I, I, I don't have to be made to set aside time on Sunday to worship Him. I don't need a rule to give to Him. I don't need rules to do anything if I value God and I value who God loves and who God values. All of a sudden, the values reduce the need for, for rules. I'll willingly do it if I value you. I don't have to be told to love you. If I value you. Number four, why talk about values, Pastor Ed? Why are they important? Values create clear direction. What I'm sharing with you, incidentally, if you're running a business, whatever job that you're on, this, this applies not just here in this forum. This applies out there. What your values are, if you're an employer, you got a business and you don't have clear values and, and your employees or your team doesn't know what those values are, you really need to spend some time. And it, and it can't be cheap talk. A builder that I dealt with, one of their, you know, they published their values in integrity and honesty are two out of the three values, and yet they don't really believe it because I've been a customer. It's like, no, you, you don't value integrity and honesty. You're just putting that out there so that it's a sales pitch so that people that are looking to get a home built with you believe it and they'll trust you and then find out that, no, those, those aren't real values. They're just slog sales slogans. Number four, values create clear direction. People pursue what they value and they avoid what they don't. If you value something, you will pursue it. You'll, be in a, you'll have one direction, no pun on the, on the boy band, but you'll have one clear direction that your values will take you in. And if you don't value that, you'll avoid it. You'll have a direction away from it. When you value God, you'll pursue God. One of the things that 
I really joy, enjoy about the Sunshine Coast is just the laid-back nature here. I love it. It's, it's uh, Australian culture, she'll be right. It's on steroids here on the coast. Seems to be. It's kind of changing a little bit. We've got traffic now that we didn't have. When I first arrived here, there's a whole bunch of stuff going up, buildings in the CBD, and, you know, people arriving here. I get excited about that. But I also, uh, I, I love the laid-back culture that comes with kind of the surfy thing, she'll be right. We don't take things too seriously. There's a part of that that I, I look at Jesus and I think, he was not in a hurry to go anywhere. Oh, he was on a mission, and he, put his, he set his face like flint, it says, you know, to go and pursue the cross for us. But he wasn't in a hurry. Oh, Martha and Mary, Lazarus is he's dying. Oh, yes, they go, let's just hang out three more days, then we'll, we might make the journey. It's a short journey, but he's dead. Oh, well, <laughs> he wasn't in a hurry. Because <laughs> he, he's the Almighty. He doesn't move according to our whim. We don't tell him to jump, and he's going to jump. He always had clear direction, but he knew what the values were. Whatever he did, he did it with intentionality. And he came to solve humanity's problems. I'd like the worship team to come up. He came, even in that meeting in Mark chapter 6 in his hometown, he came to solve humanity's problems, recovering of sight to the blind, to open the, de the ears of the deaf. He came to forgive. Ultimately, he, pro he solved the ultimate problem, which is death. But he was never in a hurry. But he was always the problem solver. The values we carry create what we communicate. Because values speak volumes. And one way to measure your value in somebody else's eyes is to listen what somebody else says about you. We'll finish with this, but Proverbs 27, 21. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. And a man is valued by what others say of him. What are people saying about you? What are people saying about the church? What are people saying about this church? That's the value that they've placed on you, the church, or even this church. The people in your world will speak good things about you because they value you or not. And the reason, this is my conclusion for this morning, because we're in a series that I... I love that fact because I didn't even get into the message, really. <laughs> but I got next week and the week after. It's good, isn't it? Well, I'll rush a good meal. I have to. When you solve problems like Jesus solved problems, people will love you. Everybody loves somebody that solves their problems. But nobody likes somebody that just complains and whinges about the problem and points out the problem and talks the problem up and that's all they talk about is the problem with this and the problem with the church, the problem with, with the coast, the problem, the problem, the problem. And, and people, like I said, with values, they'll avoid you. But if you start seeing yourself like Jesus did uh, as a problem solver, you will become incredibly valuable in your workplace, your family, society, in the church. You will become a value person and people will talk about you that's how you'll know the value they'll welcome you when you walk into their midst who doesn't love somebody that solves their problems <laughs> amen somebody's got a problem with poverty and somebody walks in to alleviate that poverty how valuable are they? If somebody has sickness or disease and somebody walks in with a healing answer for that, if somebody 
has dissension or they're going through relationship or marriage breakup and somebody enters their world that has answers to these problems and that has a, a, a big presence of God because of their prayer life, all of a sudden the value goes right through the roof and God wants to move in His church. God wants to move through you and for me, we need to become problem solvers, not echoes of the problems of this world and mere wingers. God could therefore do no mighty works through them. And it wasn't just because individually they didn't possess the faith. There was a whole dynamic to that that we're going to get into next week, but we're out of time. So I'd like everyone to stand. Thank you. Oh, God. God is so good. I wonder if you could just bow your heads, close your eyes, have an intimate moment with God right now. Because God, God wants to speak, and I believe He's been speaking already. But He really wants to speak to you intimately right now. I've said a lot. We've shared a lot. This will be on YouTube and podcast just this series so that you can share it and you can really ask God where you stand with it all because I want to see revival. Oh, I want to see I want to see an outbreak. Everything starts with the first step and if you don't know Jesus, he came to save not to condemn he came to save you from everything that's destroying you and to give you eternal life. He came as your healer, your provider. If you haven't asked him into your heart and you're here this morning, you want to give him your life so he can be your way maker. And I'd ask you right now to pray this prayer after me and mean it in your heart. And I'd also ask you to mean it so much that you'd be baptized. We want to have a water baptism. We want to do Alpha, but so few people have signed up for any of it that we want to get it going. But we need you to say yes and to stick to your commitment have people that sign up and then they don't show up. Because it is a lot of effort that goes into both of those things, Alpha and water baptism. It's a, it's a big effort. So your commitment to say yes to Jesus will be, will be followed up to do what he says. So if that's you right now, with your eyes closed, if you'd like to just say this prayer out loud after me, you can give him your heart right now, but do it with commitment. You don't try Jesus. You make him Lord of your life. Say this after me. Say, dear God, thank you for loving me so much that you gave your only son that you substituted your son's rightness with my wrongness. You took sin upon the cross. Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you. Amen. If that's you and you gave him your life and you're sincere, then you'll sign up and say, I want to be water baptized. You'll take my offer up of, of a free book that I've written on it. Fill out the yellow card. Let us know. And we'll help you get started. Be my pleasure. Amen.